So now we're going to go on to immunology. The immune system works very hard in conjunction for, with, uh, with the endocrine system in order to prevent diseases. Your neighbor doesn't have a pet shark. Does he have pet bears instead? Or is he the tiger king? Dogs. Yeah, that makes more sense, I guess. I guess if I had to guess, it would probably be dogs, not bears. <clears throat> All right. Immune system, anatomy, and physiology. So the immune system is not really an organ. So we can't really point to where the immune system is because it's not an organ. It's a constantly moving defensive system. If you wanted to point to an organ that represents your immune system, point at your skin. Your skin is the first line defense against pathogens. It's the first aspect of the immune system. It's the way that we defend ourselves against the environment that's trying to kill us at all times. It's our spacesuit. When that becomes compromised, we are hugely prone to infection. This is what used to happen in most of history before we invented penicillins. If you got a cut and it got infected, you would either lose that limb or you would die. Or you'd get extremely sick and you might overcome it, but more realistically, you would get sick and you would die. Now, thankfully, we have penicillins. We have ways to fight those off. Now, sometimes it can be sensitized to things that are not dangerous. Like I said, it can, uh, it can be sensitized to peanuts, to wasps, to medications. We have a couple different types of immunities. Natural immunity is the things we're born with. It's what's passed on to us in fetal circulation from our moms. And then acquired immunity is what we are exposed to through vaccines, through exposure to other people around us, through working on an ambulance, and just building up resistances over time. Our immune systems become stronger as we get older. We have two types of acquired immunity, humoral and cell-mediated. Humoral means it comes from the bones, like the humerus. Cell-mediated has to do with how the cells interact. Humoral associated with the production of antibodies that combine with and eliminate foreign material. Cell-mediated is associated with the formation of a group of lymphocytes that attack and destroy foreign material. The body's best defense against viruses, fungi, parasites, and some bacteria is cell-mediated bacteria immunity. Sorry, that's the best defense we have. It's also the mechanism we use to reject transplanted organs. So like I say, sometimes it does not work. We call that isoimmunity when we're fighting against beneficial foreign tissue like blood transplants or organ transplants. Autoimmunity is attacking against our own cells. Isoimmunity is against health, healthy cells. All right, anaphylaxis and allergic reaction. So how does anaphylaxis work? Well, we're exposed to an antigen or a pathogen. Our body decides this is a dangerous thing and it has an allergic reaction. It then starts designing cells that will specifically attack those pathogens or antigens if they are ever reintroduced to the system. This means that the next time we're exposed to something, we're going to have an extremely exaggerated response because we've had these killer T cells floating around looking specifically for one thing to kill everything else they ignore. And then the second we respond, we have that appear again, we release chemicals that draw those memories cells in to kill the thing. This means that every subsequent we react or experience we have with the antigen is going to get a worse and worse and worse response. I mean, eventually you plateau out and you're about as bad of a response as you can get. We call that an anaphylactic reaction. Now, I have a question for you guys. Is it possible to have an anaphylactic reaction if you've never been exposed to the thing before, you've never had a peanut, can you have an anaphylactic reaction? Yes? I'll give you guys a hint. It's actually a trick question. If you have never been exposed to something before in your life and you have what we would refer to as an anaphylactic reaction, those are called anaphylactoid reactions. Technically, it's only an anaphylactic reaction if you have had a prior sensitization to the antigen beforehand. If it's the first time you've ever experienced it, it's anaphylactoid. Now, ultimately, 
you're right, Phil, it's the same thing. But there is a slight difference in terminology that NREMT might want you to know about. So it's a little bit of a trick question. <clears throat> Here's this slide talks about it right there. Anaphylactoid is not mediated by the antigen antibody reaction had no previous exposure to an antigen. Now I have another question for you guys. What causes the most anaphylactic reactions in the, in the world? What do you think causes the most anaphylactic reactions? Do you think it's bees? Do you think it's peanuts? Do you think it's something else? Peanuts is a good guess. Peanuts is way up there, but that's not the answer. I'll give you another hint. Bees are not the answer either. Shellfish, really great guess. It's up there, not the answer. Bananas, another really good guess. Also not the answer. <clears throat> I'll give you guys a hint. Most anaphylactic reactions happen in the hospital. Now, does anybody want to throw a new guess out there? Yes, medications, specifically penicillins. Penicillins cause the most anaphylactic reactions. Most anaphylactic reactions happen in hospitals, not while you're having a picnic at a park. Although that's the, that's the scenario we always envision when we picture anaphylaxis. And it should make sense, right? We're giving medications. We don't know if the patient is allergic to them. It's very possible they could have this exaggerated immune system response. Now, we only call it anaphylaxis under certain criteria. So everything else we just call an immune system response, an allergic reaction. Usually this can have little things like maybe a little bit of itching on the skin, maybe some, uh, some hives or urticaria, just a little bit of rash, maybe a little itchiness in the throat. I know because I've been allergic to things before. I, I've, I had a, a slight latex allergy, and that's the same protein that you find in quite a lot of fruits, like um, bananas, tomatoes, avocados, things like that. So for a long time, I was a little bit allergic to those. If I'd eat them, my mouth would get a little itchy. That was it. However, it changed. That was in my 20s. When I hit my mid-20s, my allergies changed, and now I can eat those foods without any problems. So here's the other thing about anaphylactic reactions. The faster you start reacting to that thing, the worse your reaction is going to be. If it's been 30 minutes or an hour since you ate the peanut butter and jelly sandwich and your throat's a little itchy and you call 911, the chance that you're going to go into anaphylaxis or anaphylactoid reaction is pretty much zero. Now, I don't want to say zero because you guys know in medicine there is no such thing as, as guaranteed cases but it's pretty much zero. But if you go into a reaction within a couple minutes or within a minute of ingesting the thing, expect a very exaggerated response. <clears throat> so what happens? Well, the first thing is histamine starts increasing cellular permeability. Histamine makes everything leakier. Yeah, especially with kids, you're right. Plasma leaks into the interstitial space. Remember, the interstitial space is the space in between the cells outside of the vasculature. It causes dilation of capillaries and venules. This is so we can release those white blood cells and red blood cells to help, and platelets to clot, to form scars, to heal. And relaxation of smooth muscle in the GI system and bronchus. So what's interesting about this is most shock does not involve the GI system doesn't. Most shock shuts that down, right? That's the part of the sympathetic nervous system reaction is shut down the GI system, shunt that blood up to the heart and lungs. Okay, that makes sense. Anaphylaxis is different. Remember, anaphylaxis is a distributive shock. The problem is we have all the same amount of blood. The problem is where's that blood going? It's not going where it's supposed to. This is why blood pressure tanks. <clears throat> Those leaky capillaries, start causing a drop in the blood pressure. We're reducing the preload. We're reducing the amount of blood returning to the heart. Causes urticaria, which is the, those hives, flushing of the skin, angioedema, which is swelling of the face and lips and mouth and tongue, low blood pressure. 
all mucus passageways are going to be increased. All right. You guys don't need to know all about this, but leukotrains are also released. These help, these constrict the bronchi. It's not necessarily what we want, but it's trying to limit exposure to those antigens. It thinks maybe it's breathing something in, and if it breathes in less and gets out of the area, it might be okay. Eosinophils are types of white blood cells. They're attracted to the site. They contain an enzyme that deactivates the leukotrienes. <clears throat> so expect redness in the eyes. A runny nose is what rhinitis means. Angioedema, swelling of the face. Urticaria or hives, and then contact dermatitis. Symptoms can range from sneezing and coughing to complete airway obstruction and laryngeal and epiglottic edema, they're swelling. Here's some angioedema noted. You can see in the lips, the face, probably the tongue as well. Obviously what we're most concerned with here is the airway constriction. This is what kills people in anaphylaxis. The inability to breathe, the constriction of the bronchi and airway obstruction, the swelling of the throat and mouth. If they're having trouble breathing, that's gonna all be a major concern. This is why our first line defense against anaphylaxis is epinephrine. There's a swollen tongue. The cardiovascular effects, mild hypotension to profound shock. Dysrhythmias may be present. They might complain of chest pain if there's ischemia. Oops. GI effects expect leakiness, vomiting, projectile vomiting, and uncontrollable diarrhea in extreme cases. The nervous system effects, sympathetic response because of low cell oxygen and low blood pressure. Cutaneous effects, these are skin effects. This is the big thing that helps us differentiate anaphylaxis, right? That angioedema, the hives and urticaria, swelling of the face, neck, and tongue. This is a good indication of hives. You can see how it's darker around the edges than it is in the center. However, this can present in quite a few different ways, as you can see. Initial care is at supporting the failing vital functions. Mostly it's securing that airway, getting epinephrine on board, getting bronchodilators on board, so albuterol atrovent, diphenhydramine to, to slow the histamine release, and potentially support for their blood pressure, maybe through fluid boluses or maybe dopamine or some other presser. In extreme cases, we might need to do a surgical airway or like a needle or surgical um, thoracostomy. Try to get a history about them if you can. Might, we can use all sorts of other things. Corticosteroids can help. Mag sulfate can help, as well as any other of these drugs we talked about. A couple of disorders affecting the immune system primarily. Lupus is a big one. Lupus has a lot of patients, but lupus is kind of the forgotten autoimmune disease because AIDS has really taken the, uh, the forefront. This will cause inflammation of the joints, skin, kidneys, blood cells, brain, heart, and lungs joint pain, stiffness, and swelling, as well as this famous butterfly-shaped rash on the face. Skin lesions can appear and worsen with sun exposure, so they're going to be, we call this photosensitivity or sun sensitivity. Fingers and toes turn white or blue when exposed to cold or during stressful periods. It's called Raynaud's phenomenon. We'll see photos of this. As well as shortest breath, chest pain, dry eyes, and headaches. So this is that butterfly rash. What will kill someone with lupus? A, an opportunistic affection, the same thing as HIV and AIDS. A couple of them, another one, sorry, here is scleroderma. This is an autoimmune connective tissue disease. Again, remember the connective tissues, your bones, your joints, your tendons, your ligaments, cartilage. Scleroderma is not a single disease, it's a group of diseases. We have two main types. Localized and generalized. Localized affects the skin, further divided into two different types based on how it appears. Systemic sclerosis is divided into limited scleroderma and diffuse scleroderma. 
depending on how it comes about. Patients with a systemic sclerosis may have symptoms which fit a characteristic pattern referred to as crest. And I don't expect you to memorize these, but this is interesting information. Calcinosis, these are calcium deposits on connective tissue, so expect hardening and, and stiffening of those joints. Renaud's phenomenon, small blood vessels, the fingers, toes, and ears constrict with cold or anxiety. Esophageal dysfunction, sclerodactyly, which is thick, shite, shiny, tight skin on the fingers and toes, and telangiectasis, which is small red spots on the hands and face. And there's going to be photos of all these in a second here. Women account for most of the scleroderma cases, specifically women in the 30 to 50 year old age range. So here's a photo, not a great one, but this is a photo of Renaud's phenomenon. You can see the kind of bluing on the fingertips in cold and in stress. Anytime the sympathetic nervous system has to start activating. Sclerodactyly, you can see that the fingers are very shiny. The skin is very thick. And there's telangiectasis, which are those red spots, as well as skin lesions. I don't know about you guys, but I can smell this slide through the screen. <clears throat> all right, transplant rejection. We're all, I'm only gonna cover this one real briefly because we don't need to worry too much about transplant rejection because that's not really realistically an EMS concern. If there is any concern about transplant rejection, it will be handled by the doctors. The number one reason that transplants get rejected though is because the patients don't stay on top of their meds like they're supposed to. If patients continue to take their medications, their anti-immune suppressing medications, they, most of these would be fine, but people don't do that. 25,000 organ transplants are performed in the US every year, most of them kidneys. Survival rates following transplantations are now approaching 90% for one year and 75% for five years. Central to this success was the introduction of drugs that suppress the immune system and prevent rejection. Most common of these are called calcineurin inhibitors, CNIs. However, there's, these are not good for your kidneys. Pretty much everyone taking these will develop kidney toxicity. A lot of them will progress to end-stage renal failure at the end of their lives. We classify transplant rejections in three phases, acute, chronic, and hyperacute. Chronic, just in terms of slow loss of functions, this can take, um, a lot of amount of time, it's, it's not specified in here, but it's basically any, anything over um, a couple of years. Acute, it occur, occurs in some degrees to, in all transplants, except in identical twins, unless immunosuppression is achieved. So remember, before we had um, immunosuppressive drugs, the only way we could perform a, an organ transplant was if the patient had an identical twin, not even a fraternal twin, but an identical twin. Because keep in mind, there's really nothing special about fraternal twins other than they just happen to be born at the same time, right? They're two separate eggs and two separate sperms that become two separate brothers. They just happen to be born at the same day. Or sisters, I guess, or one of each. A single episode of acute rejection if recognized and treated, will usually prevent organ failure. Recurring episodes is probably going to lead to what we call chronic rejection. And then there's hyperacute, which happens within a couple minutes. If it's left implanted, there's going to be a huge systemic-wide inflammatory response. It needs to be removed. It's really the only thing we can do. We can treat these acute rejections with dosage of corticosteroids, but chronic rejection will only need to retransplant if that's even feasible. Hyperacute just needs to be removed. All right. I'm not going to read you guys this organ procurement. It's interesting, but it's not going to be tested on. And let's keep it to the stuff that we need to know about. Basically, the rule here is that we've got a lot of stuff that it takes in order to harvest organs and transplant organs from person to person. So it can be actually very difficult but we can transfer quite a few things.